higher gossip is the kind of conversation that is at once titillating and illuminating. My first contact with St. John's College was when I went to Columbia because the humanities course at Columbia was born at the same time as the new program. The great difference between the Columbia humanities and St. John's was that at Columbia there were lectures on the books. Of course, we participated in class too. But the hardest thing for me to do at St. John's College was to shut up. But I didn't think of coming to St. John's at all because I was afraid of Euclid. In graduate school, I had to switch to the history department because I wanted to do a book on Wagner. But as a consequence, I found myself teaching modern European history at major Ivy League school without ever having taken a course in it. I hope Columbia doesn't hear this now, but it's too late and I'm 88 years old. I was not happy teaching a course that I had never studied in a subject I had never studied. One day when I was extremely unhappy about the dishonesty of my teaching at Columbia, I visited a friend of mine who was a painter, and visiting him was Douglas Allen Book, an important composer who was a tutor at St. John's College. Douglas simply said, come to St. John's. And I did, to try it for a year in 1960-61. And I stayed ever since. That's how I came to St. John's, through one of the more casual accidents of my life. And I really wish there had been a very firm decision, knowing that this is exactly where I should have been. And it is, I think, where I should have been. They were so afraid when I came here that officially I was an historian that it was the main subject of my interview by the instruction committee. One of the elderly tutors said to me, I've just finished doing seminars on Hobbes's Leviathan, and we did not mention once the British Civil Wars. I didn't know whether I was supposed to say how awful and prove that I'm an historian or say how good you don't do any history. And I simply said, I don't think there would have been any harm in mentioning it, which I still feel is the right answer, but certainly not to read Hobbes in the light of the Civil Wars. We're afraid of historians here. You know, we, we famously do not do history. When I mentioned to Garrett Mattingly at Columbia, I said, you know, they don't do history there. He said, on the contrary, they're the only place where they do history properly because they actually read the books rather than learn what the books represented. Victor Zuckercandle was still alive when I came here, and he read my book and crossed all of Annapolis. We lived at up, which is not very far, and he said, I came to tell you that your book on Faulkner is extremely superficial. Although that was not something that pleased me, it was typical, it was the sort of thing that one should say at St. John's, although I suppose one should be a bit more um, soothing about it. I stayed at St. John's mainly because I became part of a group who were kind of a family. Jacob Klein and his wife, Mrs. Klein, who had been the daughter-in-law of Edmund Husserl, and Eva Braun and Beata Ruhm von Oppen, and it was like a very, very happy family, I used to say, because no one was related to anyone else. After I was here a year, if someone said to me, why are you staying at St. John's, the answer would have been Yasha, who was simply wonderful. And at the time, he had just completed his Mino book, and he was reading it to a group of select colleagues. That impressed me, that, that even though it was a book, he thought of it as something oral, that he had to get the response of saying this, to people, although he wrote English beautifully. 
Williamson, and I thought that the essays and lectures should be collected. It was absolutely necessary, particularly the lectures that I know are um, indispensable, and it's good that we have them. Yasha would never have approved of it. He was not interested in publication. So the only books of Klein's are the Greek mathematics book that Eva translated, the Mino book, which is wonderful, and which I gather he was very much encouraged to write here, and which gives so much of what is behind St. John's. The most difficult things in philosophy are probably in the trilogy book. That's a truly philosophical book, and in a way, a kind of ultimate opposite of a seminar. In the seminar, you don't know the book at all. In reading the Plato's trilogy, you have to know the book thoroughly. Unless you're interested in the Theotetus and the Sophist and the Statesman, you're not going to love Klein's book on, on the Plato's trilogy. You have to know the text so well that you can go over it with him and detect what aside he might, might make or what interpretation. My reading at St. John's really changed when I had to read for seminar because instead of looking for the moment here and there that I needed for either a lecture or a class or a book, I read the book responding to what the author had to tell me. And um, for a first reading, it's wonderful. Many tutors complain that they have to read the book so quickly. That's incidentally one of the reasons why Curtis Wilson invented the preceptorial, so that there would be a chance to spend more than two or three seminars on a book. Quick seminar first reading is absolutely essential for the student, so they know what to get back to. There, sh there has to be a first reading before you read the book. One reads at St. John's differently because once you've had a solid background in Greek philosophy, you read everyone from a point of view of what does this say about Plato or Aristotle. <laughs> It was because of Yasha that I became particularly interested in Plato's Ion. I was terribly disturbed because I thought that, let's say, late Beethoven was profound. And I used to go around saying that the C-sharp minor or the B-flat major quartet tells us something that we would otherwise not know. And in reading the Ion, I got the idea that no poet, or certainly no musician, could know things that a philosopher doesn't know. In fact, you can't trust art because it's not philosophical. This disturbed me because I wanted to trust the vague feeling of profundity that you are being told something that no philosopher could tell you. The only thing Yasha said to me in Santa Fe when he stayed with me for two weeks and I kept asking the question, and finally in exasperation, he said to me, there are philosophical poets. Of course, there was nothing in the ion to tell us that, unless in, as a substitute for the inspiration that ion speaks of, which I've always taken and which I thought he took as a joke, that is, all they have is mere inspiration, which is nothing. They're all poets who are inspired. In his essay on the Ion, instead of answering that question, the second half of his lecture is about a great moment in the Iliad. But the implication that, that Achilles yelling on the walls of Troy is somehow an answer to my question. Philosophically, the central question of my life was how can we trust art? It may be because Wagner was so utterly untrustworthy and such a bad man. Whenever I felt that I was transported, there was something um, untrue about it, something fake. According to the Ion, I'd have to call every poet a mere rhapsode. So I wanted to know why I feel I, work, I can call at least certain poets, Shakespeare, Sophocles, Aeschylus, 
Beethoven, Mozart. My gosh, I don't think it's profounder than the Italian operas of Mozart. Maybe I've got, I've got to read the ion again and take seriously that inspiration might actually be inspiration. But isn't that a great question? The great literary side of St. John's, the artistic side, the musical side. Leo Strauss told me a joke once, and I remember being disappointed that it wasn't funny. If, if that's heard by the Straussians of America, my, my, there'll either be great disappointment. Anyway, I'm not particularly interested in political philosophy, believe it or not. I may, it's a, I'm a rare tutor. He may have heard of that and figured he should tell me a joke instead. I hate the great books, but there's no other good way of referring to them except that, you know, the books that have come down to us as trustworthy or it's terrible. And you have to say great books and you sound like Mortimer Adler, who I'm perfectly willing to mention pejoratively because he thought there were 101 great ideas and you should not number ideas. I met Hannah Arendt once when she lectured here and I had dinner with her at the Kleins. And Mrs. Klein's comment on Hannah Arendt, whom she had already known, was that she had very good legs for her age. There's another thing that you may have to cut out. There's a picture that's quite well known and often used for publicity. And it looks as though there's a great philosophical conversation going on. And Yasha was, was always watched Hawaii Five O. He had missed it the previous night, and I was giving him an account of what happened on Hawaii Five O. Yasha was totally unmusical. That was one of the things I learned, that there can be someone I highly respect and think of as the most philosophical person I've ever met, who was totally unmoved by music. There are such people. They're fairly rare. The very week in which Yasha told me that there were only 12 philosophers in the history of Western thought, he got an advert from the American Philosophical Association saying there are 372, 943,000 philosophers in America today. That is, anyone who, who's an assistant in a philosophy department refers to himself as a philosopher. That's the way one might say an historian or an English major or something. There were seven Greeks, and you have to make up your own pre-Socratics, and then you, of course, have Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and earlier Her Heraclitus and Parmenides, and then find two others. If Eva sees this, she's going to be furious. The five Germans are Leibniz, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, and Heidegger. Heidegger, he told me, is the only one of these gentlemen he would never shake the hand of. The one advice I know Yasha gave to students who came to him as dean and said, what should I do? Don't study philosophy. If you wanted to study Kant or Hegel, learn German. Go to a German department. And we're not training people to be philosophers, Lord help us. Oh, what that was so of. So instead of only 12 philosophers, we were training more to add to the 327,000. Lord, I mean, we should be closed immediately. <laughs> What you do at St. John's is the fundamentals of everything. Doing Euclid is doing the fundamentals of geometry. Our tutorials should be about the elements of this, that, or the other thing. In the highest and best sense, it's elementary. I had taken music theory all my life. I was at home in the most complicated chromatic harmony of César Franck or Chopin or Wagner. And I came to do the music tutorial here, and I realized that I had never thought of anything really fundamental philosophically about music. 
I had never even thought about why I am moved, only that I am moved. A book could not do anything better than show you what question you've been asking all along. And it also justifies what seems like a bromide when we say we're not interested in answers, we're interested in questions. Life is so short, and I'm saying that at 88, that we're lucky enough if we see a few questions that really matter to us, and um, maybe half an answer. Of course, that sounds pompous. Each time you ask the question, it's deeper. Just as each time in seminar, you hope that instead of saying, there's thingumbob again, meaning some idea that you heard over and over again, you hope that this time that idea has suddenly come to life. Seminar should be parallel somehow to what everyone always says about the Mino. You discover that all your life you've known the Pythagorean theorem, and you have that wonderful myth that you don't learn things, you recollect them. Well, even in seminar, we could talk that way, that by talking in seminar, a student might recollect something that was there. That's why we keep saying you should talk in seminar. Everyone should go through life having a don rag once a year, which he should be told he should talk in seminar. In general, you don't know what you're recollecting until you've said it out loud. I'm being an example right now with my discovering that all my life I've been talking the ion, or at least presenting the ion to myself as a question. That's what happens in St. John's. When you're doing a seminar on, um, well, I don't know, what should I take? On Hobbes again. And you, you're, you're bound to hear the same things, but there may be happily a point where even the tutor says, my gosh, I've heard that before, but this time it's new. And you hope that for the student it may be new, because by the time of Hobbes he's not repeating what he's heard about the Greeks. The reason we have jokes about the early seminars and the freshmen talking about the Greeks is that we know that they've heard it in high school, so that by the Greeks you mean my high school teachers told me. You can tell when finally they've seen something for themselves, often in Homer. It's no longer the Greeks, but my gosh, I now really believe that Helen is the most beautiful woman in the world, and that Penelope, I know what faithfulness is, or I know what a fool is. All a great teacher does or even a mediocre teacher, me, is point to something. Ultimately, the great teachers I've had, even Yasha, all they do is point. They've pointed to me that all I know, I may not have gotten anything else, but I know that's a good thing. Or maybe occasionally that's a bad thing. The one thing absolutely quiet of a student all the time I mean, is attention. You've got to attend to everything, and you, you may have a different view of what, where deepness lies, where depth lies. You have to look for that. You have to think about it, and the more you attend to it, if you've got any stuff of your own, the more it'll tell you what you're looking for. And education is really saying, look into that. That's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, even if you know it's an exaggeration. I'm so much affected by Tristan and Isolde that I think it's bad for my health. It's pointing. Don't read Titus Andronicus. Read King Lear. I'm brave enough to say that. The only reason to read Titus Andronicus or the Comedy of Errors is if you want to become an authority on Shakespeare. But if you want to become an educated man, reread Macbeth for the 40th time, or Antony and Cleopatra, or Lear, or Hamlet. I mean, I'm, I don't want to leave anything out now, so I'll have to mention 30 plays. The people who talk about St. John's ought to make use of the well-known distinction between training and education. You're not trained to be anything here Heaven forbid trained to be a philosopher. 
because in that sense, a philosopher is, is not a philosopher. I just, you know, I'm just proving something for or against St. John's. As a tutor, I f figured I had taught badly if I talked too much like this at a tutorial. Here I'm being given carte blanche and I love it. But I'm realizing now that, I, that I'm talking this way that I'm beginning to formulate all sorts of things that I'd never seen before. And I was deprived of that. Would that have happened if I stayed at Columbia and lectured or went to Cambridge and became a professor of something? I don't know. I would have lectured, let's say, in Cambridge on Aristotle's poetics. God, would I hate to hear. This is my 35th year of lecturing on the poetics. Can you imagine anything so awful?